Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's podcast. In just over two weeks, I will be at a video game con in New Jersey. I'll be doing one full panel myself, and I think I might be a guest on somebody else's panel as well. Unfortunately, none of the panel schedules have been released yet, so I'm not sure what day or time. Hopefully, they'll have that out by next week's podcast so I can give everybody a heads up. Uh, but anyway, I hope to see all my Jersey folk there. I really liked that one. I was at it two years ago, and uh, I'm, you know, hopefully it's just as good or better as it was then. But anyway, a ton of stuff to talk about this week, so I'm going to try to get through a little quicker than normal. I won't dilly dally on anything and try to keep this one as short as possible. Still probably going to be a long one though. So uh, sit back and here's this week's retro gaming news. First up is a follow up from last year. When I originally did the interview with Matt Phillips, the creator of Tanglewood, he dropped a pretty huge bomb in the middle of that interview and told everybody that as soon as everything was released and he was ready to go, he was going to release the source code for Tanglewood. And just as he promised, he did just about a year later. So that's absolutely incredible. And just a reminder that we should all support the developers that we really like. Um, honestly, I, I don't have the room for physical cartridges. I wish I did. I would have bought Tanglewood immediately. Um, you know, I would have bought I would buy a lot more if I had room to, to actually collect, but I really wanted to play it legally, so I did buy it on Steam, and you get the Genesis ROM for free when you do that, and to be honest, I never even loaded it up on my PC. I just bought it, got the free Genesis ROM, and played it from there, so... Uh, you know, just a big shout out to, to Matt and all the work that he's been doing, and I can't wait to see what other stuff he does. So please support your favorite developers, um, you know, buy the games uh, and make sure that with the right support, we can get people like Matt to continue doing awesome stuff like making new games and then releasing that code to the public. That was pretty awesome. So thanks again to Matt. The first reviews are in for the Genesis Mini Console, and it looks like it performs about on par with the NES and SNES Classic. So that means that casual gamers who just want to experience these games won't have an experience ruined by a slapped together collection, like what we very commonly get on other platforms like Xbox and PlayStation, or of course I always use the PlayStation Mini as an example. Um, it looks like out of the box it's going to be decent, but in all of the different reviews there were, you know, there were things that enthusiasts like us would probably have wanted but the the thing that really got me was when Joe Redifer measured the audio delay and it was something like 11 frames more of a delay than the original and I made sure to follow up with Joe about this because very often those of us who take these measurements myself included by the way will say things like oh it's 11 frames of delay but we want to make sure that you're comparing this to the original. And Joe did. He did it right. It is 11 frames of audio delay more than the original game was. And that's borderline experience ruining right there. It certainly is for those of us who grew up with these games and still have real hardware that, let's say you use real hardware on RGB monitors and wanted to use this on your flat screen as a neat, fun new experience that comes with a really cool mini Genesis, um, that would probably drive most of us crazy. So this is not the final edition, but I just can't see being less than a month away from the release, them going back and reflashing the firmware and all of these. So we could cross our fingers and hope that that happens but curb your expectations for this even with m2 uh making this it is a bit disappointing that the audio delay was that bad and you know the rest of the complaints that the other reviewers my life in gaming um uh, modern vintage gamer and i think a few other people have gotten their hands on one but maybe haven't posted their videos yet so i don't want to leak out any any new info but everybody basically said that it's a neat console it's fun it's great for collectors um and they don't hate it but it could have been a little bit better in a few different ways. So hopefully if you were, had your heart set on one of these, the audio delay won't drive you as crazy as it would probably drive me. Uh, but I don't know. I guess we'll have to all see for ourselves in about a month. I still pre-ordered mine because I love the Genesis. And, you know, even if I just got a really cool three-button controller with a USB port and a neat little Genesis Mini to collect, that's good enough for me. But hopefully the experience might be good enough for most people. Next, Matt Jolly, aka QC Retro, has just released a free 3D printed design for the open source Minigun Arcade Supergun. So the Minigun was the one designed by Frank that, uh, that's as basic and straightforward as you can get for a Supergun that still works very well. Uh, I say that, I, I use the words basic and straightforward lovingly. I mean, it's just a good, well-built 
you know, uh, straightforward super gun. And it's great that there's now a case for it because it's just so easy to have open electronics, touch something metal and short something. And, you know, I'd hate to have anybody lose their, uh, uh, you know, their rare arcade board because it's something shorted out. So anytime there's a way to have cases for it, it's always good. I put cardboard down, um, which is a little cheesy, but whatever. As long as there's a good non-conductive layer between the board and whatever else is conductive, it does help. But if I had the choice, I would put cool 3d printed cases around all of my uh, arcade board and arcade equipment so thanks very much to qc retro for making that jacob proctor aka tinker plunk aka arithmador couldn't decide on the name huh dude <laughs> uh he just came out with an open source multi-out breakout now i'm showing you um a hacked together prototype because i needed this for the uh expo presentations i've been doing the final product you don't need any of these bodge wires i uh, probably shouldn't even be showing this on camera but i was just excited that i got to test out a demo of it but essentially what this does is break out all of the outputs that are available from the SNES multi-out, and he's got one for the PlayStation available as well. So any experts already know what I'm about to say, but beginners and possibly even intermediate users just need to understand that this isn't doing any conversions at all. All it's doing is breaking out all the signals to be available. So for me personally, I decided to use RGB, S-Video, and Composite at the same time to do the demo. Um, you could also choose to get RGB with the RCA ports up here. So that's the red, green, blue, and then you would have to use like a composite video as sync or I guess Luma if you had a custom cable but that's a great thing for people that just want to use good quality RCA cables and use RCA to BNC adapters for monitors uh, and this has a handy little stand here so that when you um, or I guess a foot is a better way to describe it so if you plug in something heavy like a BNC cable it's not going to put pressure on the multi out it'll put pressure on the foot so these things are really excellent for testing for demos and all this other stuff um, you know and you could just don't don't get two outputs at the same time. So even though there are two RGB outputs for convenience, if you use them both simultaneously, you could and probably will blow out the video chip. And same thing if you're using like um, uh, S-Video uh, and composite video with the PlayStation version. Because remember, the PlayStation doesn't output direct C-Sync. You always have to use either composite video or Luma. So for example, if you were using Luma as sync on the PlayStation version um, on the uh, D-Sub adapter, you couldn't then use an S-Video cable to a CRT. Otherwise, you'd be drawing double the signal on the Luma line and that would blow it out. So like I said, for experts, Probably I didn't even need to say all that, but it's a very good reminder for everybody else. Uh, I just, I find it to be super, super handy. I've seen other one of these floating around. A few had been promised to be released, but never did. So whatever. Uh, there's one other open source design similar to this coming out soon. So this is just great for testers, for streamers. Um, I can't tell you how many people I know that have been trying to find ways to do things like RGB to a capture card and S video to a cheap CRT. So you get a zero lag, very good experience uh, as you're gaming and where all your streams could be in RGB and you do it at the same time in a way where it uh, you don't need any extra adapters and splitters and stuff. So thanks very much to Jacob for making these available to all of us. Hopefully uh, he'll have versions of it for sale on his website at some point. Uh, for me personally, I like this just the way it is. And right when I thought I was going to say I don't need the top RGB on the SNES version, um, so pick one or the other, right as I was about to, to write that up in the write-up, I did the demo at the last expo and my BNC to VGA cable broke. Uh, and I needed to end up then using a mixture of the RCAs and the VGA connector. Once again, it's not VGA, it's just a connector that pipes through the RGB. So uh, having these extra options actually saved my butt um, uh, out at the last expo I was at in Long Island. So very awesome tool to have. I recommend anybody who needs stuff like this for the PlayStation or SNES to grab one. Magic Trashman has just completed a tutorial on how to do a pad hack on a Neo Geo Mini controller. So those are the controllers that look just like the Neo Geo CD ones, but have a USB connector on the outside. Um, and his tutorial does two things. First, it teaches you how to make it compatible with a real Neo Geo, and then it also replaces the D-pad with a, a clicky one. So 
there's two halves to that. The replacing the D-pad is pretty complicated and really for enthusiasts only. And I mean that respectfully, of course, but turning the controller into a Neo Geo controller is actually quite easy because all Neo Geo controllers are just on off buttons. There's no logic that goes into it. So essentially all you would have to do is wire each button to a port on uh, just a regular uh, DB15, I believe it is, port. And that's really all you'd have to do. And I think that's an amazing idea and something that I've been doing to all of my arcade sticks. I even bought a couple of the Retrobit USB controllers and ripped out the USB and made the, or actually I'm having Jose Cruz do that for me now. Um, I did that to one and it kind of fell apart. So I'm going to have a pro do it for me, but uh, I think they're just the really great ways to experience things like super guns. Uh, and especially for me who does a lot of testing, I often don't want a giant arcade stick on my table, just a, a beat up little controller is nice. So if you're using super guns or if you have a Neo Geo uh, and you just have a preferred controller, um, contact your modder, try to do it yourself. I mean, this is, I hate to waste anything, but this is the perfect excuse to go grab one of those $8 controllers from Amazon and then a $10 cable, cut the end off and wire the cable directly into the controller and have yourself a, a Neo Geo controller. So uh, pretty cool mod to start. It's a little cramped in there, so that's maybe it's not a beginner mod, but uh, it's something that's certainly worth trying, and you could try it with cheap parts that you don't have to end up uh, end up ruining anything expensive. So if you wanted to give something like this a try, maybe try it with one of the cheap controllers on Amazon, then grab one of these Neo Geo Minis, and then maybe do the D-pad hack to it. But either way, it's cool, and uh, I'll hopefully have some info, whether it's a Twitter post or whatever else on the controller hacks we've been doing once. Uh, maybe I'll just put that all into a super gun video later this year or something like that. It looks like Dunin, the creator of optical drive emulators for both the Dreamcast and the Saturn, has gone and outdone himself again. He had opened up pre-orders on the FM Towns Marty optical drive emulator, but in order for you to purchase it, uh, he's requiring proof that you own an FM Towns Marty. So you need to get him the serial number and a legible photo, but it has to be less than 250 kilobytes in size uh, in order to be uh, considered for a pre-order purchase on this. I, I mean, I have no words for this. I, there's no way somebody as brilliant as Dunin could think that this is a smart idea. It's impossible. His his technical work is absolutely amazing, and I have no nothing negative to say about the actual work that he does, but that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. So that means I could just go and, you know, ask some friends for some pictures of some FM Towns Martys, buy one or two of them, and still scalp them on eBay. This is not going to stop scalpers. This is only going to limit your pool to scalpers who already own an FM Towns Marty. Like, I don't, I don't understand. The only conclusion my brain can come to is that this ego is so big and so crazy that this guy loves knowing that people can't buy his products. It's the only thing that my brain could wrap around. And that's a horrible thing to say, and I would tell him to his face if he was standing right in front of me. I'm not an internet keyboard warrior hiding behind something. I'm right in front of camera right now telling Dunin, if you are listening, this is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. Every respectable person in the retro gaming community has offered you help to make lots of quantity of these things in a safe environment. Maybe it'll cost a few dollars more, but if you have these things readily available and in stock for a somewhat reasonable price, the chances are it's probably not going to get cloned. The only reason the GDMU got cloned is because it got so fucking ridiculous to get one that people just said, screw it. So I hate cloning. I hate people that steal from the gaming community, but you've done this to yourself. So I have, I just, I got so much anger about the situation about this. And especially for FM Towns Marty, how many of those consoles do we really think are out there compared to something like the Dreamcast or the Saturn? Why couldn't you just make a hundred of these things and sell them and then judge the demand for next time? I just don't get it. It makes me so upset. It makes me upset because I feel like it's a direct slap in the face to everybody in the retro gaming community that wants these products, but it also makes me upset because I want this guy to get bags of money sent to him. I want him to be able to sell as many as people want to buy and be able to rake in the cash and maybe, if possible, even get enough money flowing through to make this your day job so that you could just concentrate on making these very awesome optical drive emulators. So, I, I don't know. If anybody knows him, 
try and talk some sense into him. I have a feeling that there is no chance in hell that that's possible because he just gets worse. I just can't, I can't believe that somebody would do something that stupid and limit the sales that much. So, you know, hate me as much as you want for saying all of that. I've reached out to him personally. I know a lot of people have as well. It, you know, if this is the choice that you're t uh, making and how you sell your products, you're getting no help from me. A company named Infonic is releasing a virtual synth named the RM RYM2612, which is basically a VST plugin that allows you to create sounds based on things like the original Genesis. I'd seen plugins like this earlier this year for the Genesis and SMS and planned on doing an in-depth review, but I've had no time to play guitar and to make music lately, so unfortunately I, I passed, uh, passed over on that one. But stuff like this is really awesome, and it helps people without original hardware and without a lot of programming ability be able to create these sounds using the same tools that you would make to create music that you're probably already making. Um, so I'm a really big fan of all these things, and I, I do wish at some point we'd be able to have it translated into something like the uh, fractal audio stuff because the thought of being able to plug my guitar in and just making the sounds from the guitar would be even cooler. Now, I know that's way harder to do. You know, that's just like, that's just as silly as me saying, oh, why don't you just make a PS2 optical drive emulator? Uh, but I could still have some wishful thinking in here. So uh, it's pretty awesome that we get to create music based on some of the sounds that are very iconic. Um, and uh, in fact, they call this the synth of rage, which is obviously a throwback to Streets of Rage. So uh, anybody that's a musician and likes the classic game sounds, please check this one out. Someone has just created a project that allows you to take an N64 controller and use it on an MSX. It's based off of an Arduino board, and as long as you use an N64 controller extension cable to wire it in, you don't have to mod the N64 controller at all. Just build something onto a breadboard with an Arduino and then program it properly. It works for both PAL and NTSC modes, which I guess was uh, an issue because you had to make sure that the analog stick position synced up with whatever the frequency was, but it looks like that's solved now. So seems like a really cool thing for anybody that wants to use N64 controllers on an MSX, but serious question, who would want to? Very often I ask these questions of things I don't really get and the answers in the comments make me feel dumb and I should have thought of it anyway, but I'm very curious about this. Is there a need for games with both a D-pad and an analog stick for MSX that you can't get using other controllers? Really interested to see anybody's opinions on this or if it's just for N64 lovers. Anyone who's going to be out in Seattle this Saturday, August 24th, might want to check out the Seattle Retro Computing Society meetup. There's going to be a lot of weird old computers there, and uh, it makes me kind of jealous, actually. I'd really like to go and mess with these, and you know, some of it would be nostalgia, some of it would be trying for the first time, but this looks pretty cool. Um, if you sign up, you could bring some of your own stuff, too, uh, and I believe anybody who brings food uh, would be very appreciated. <laughs> Game creation software called MD Studio was just released on GitHub, and it's software that was designed to help people create Sega Genesis or Mega Drive games, and I think that's really awesome that there's more software development tools out there. It looks like the person who created it also received help from Matt Phillips, the creator of Tanglewood, to help make this project a little bit easier for people. So I'm really excited to see what this results in. I love seeing new games on old consoles, and I like the whole spectrum of it. I like people who just do little hello, hello world stuff that you might want to just throw on a ROM cart and check out for a few seconds. And I also like the really big in-depth games that people have been coming out with as well, and everything in between. So um, if you are considering doing some kind of programming for the Genesis and have been holding back, maybe check this one out and see if this is finally the, uh, the gateway drug you need to start programming for the Genesis. There's now an FPGA-based Mini-ITX MSX2 compatible motherboard called the SX1. Yeah, Vanessa tried to get me with all those acronyms, but it only took me like four tries to get it. Ha! Uh, in all seriousness, it is exactly what I just said, a mini ITX based motherboard that's uh, pretty much a drop in for any MSX2 Plus fans. It's got SD card readers, um, S video and VGA output and sells for about 130 euros. So anybody who is looking to do their own MSX build, this uh, certainly would be a good option for it. And uh, thanks to Vanessa for all the articles this week, but you didn't get me with the acronyms. 
So here's an interesting aspect of RGB monitor preservation that I'd never really thought of until now. Um, someone named Eduardo Cruz on the Arcade Hacker blog has pointed out that some of the EEPROMs and some of the Sony BVMs could eventually die. And the chips really only have a life expectancy of about 10 years, could probably last a little bit longer than that. So uh, he started a GitHub for people to dump their own EEPROMs and uh, upload them there for anybody that needs this information should their chips die. Now, I've, uh, I have vaguely remember at one point a friend of mine upgrading my D-Series BVM at one, uh, with the latest version of the software on these EEPROMs. So I'm pretty sure that it is out there, but it's probably not in a place that's easy to find. So I am 100% backing anybody who's willing to do something like take the time to catalog all of these. Um, there's at least three chips that would need to be uh, dumped and saved. So if you have one of these and you have EEPROM dumpers, maybe just uh, check out the link and see if it's something that you'd be able to do. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard, especially on the BVMs because their cards are removable, so it makes things way easier. You don't have to open it up and worry about working on an RGB monitor and you know any of the usual discharging things that I worn out worn about. You could just slide out the card and, and grab the EEPROMs from there, but pretty interesting, and I'm glad somebody caught that. Well, here's some really depressing news. Remember those awesome undamned controller adapters that I'd gushed about a few weeks ago? It looks like the shipment going to the store that sells them got lost by DHL. And obviously, Undamned can't just magically make more of them overnight. So if these aren't found, it's going to be quite a while before we're able to get replacements for them. And hundreds of these were lost. So it's absolutely awful to hear. Um, if anybody works at DHL or knows somebody that works at DHL, please see if you could pull some strings and look into this. Because, um, you know, that might seem like a silly thing to say, but remember when all those very rare Super N uh, Nintendo games were lost a while back? The only reason they were found is because word got out and eventually it, people kicked into gear to find them. So maybe we have some retro gamers working at DHL that might be willing to help. I don't know, but uh, I feel really bad for Undamned as well as everybody who is dying to buy these things. So uh, please, if you work at DHL, see if you could lend a hand and let's all cross our fingers. Modern Vintage Gamer just posted a video showcasing how he was able to finish an unreleased game for the original Xbox called Freefall 3050 AD. I guess he had contacted the old head of Total Arcade Software and asked if he could finish the game and release it for free. Um, I guess not only is the game released for free, but it could be purchased on Steam for $2.99. So if you download it and you like it, you could still support the original developers, uh, making this kind of doubly awesome. So thank you to Modern Vintage Gamer for all of his behind-the-scenes work and stuff like this. Uh, and just a quick shout-out, I met him at Long Island Retro Gaming Expo, and he seemed pretty awesome. So very glad that I get to support his work in whatever slightly little way that I can. <laughs> Kevtris announced on a My Life in Gaming stream that support for original 32X hardware might be added to the Mega SG with use of the deck. So there was a bit of confusion around Kevtris's comments. I think some people interpreted that as if there was an FPGA core being developed for it. And I'm 99% sure that's not the case. Uh, I'm pretty sure what Kev's talking about is people that buy the Mega SG and the DAC, the digital to analog converter, then make or buy a custom cable that goes from the DAC into the 32X, allowing you to get analog RGB output using the original Mega SG and the 32X. Um, now, anybody that's tried to use a 32X on anything other than the Genesis 1 without the right adapters knows that it sometimes glitches out. You really got to prop it up properly. Uh, and that's why I'm very happy that Greg Collins has designed a, an adapter for it that allows the 32X to just sit perfectly on the Mega SG. He's selling that on his store for uh, $15. And of course, he always has the designs available for people to download themselves. And I'm really interested to see how this is all going to pan out because... Um, you know, the 32X has its own interference, just like a Model 1 Genesis. So I really want to see what it looks like now through an RGB monitor and, you know, on both sides of it. You know, I want to see how this looks on just your standard CRT and also on like a really nice calibrated BVM because I'm kind of wondering if all of the great benefits that you would get from the Mega SG are even going to apply now because you have the interference on the 32X, meaning you would then need to RGB bypass and fix all the interference on the 32X the same way you would the original Genesis. So it's definitely something um, I'm interested to see 
you know, what what would be better for most people if you're going to be uh, using it on an RGB monitor, just getting a bunch of original equipment or this. But I have the DAC. I don't have the new firmware for the Mega SG that allows for 32X support. Um, but as soon as I get that, I guess I'll just start working on a review. And uh, whenever they give me the permission to post it, I will post it. It looks like pre-orders on the JAG SD are finally open. I am very excited about this because now we finally have an easy way to throw the entire Jaguar library on an SD card and just play it with no hassle. Um, I obviously pre-ordered mine the moment I saw that they were available. Hopefully I can get one a little bit early, which I know is kind of an asshole move, asking to skip the line, but I would like to get a review out there as quickly as possible and pretty much just show this thing off to the world because, you know, the Jaguar is obviously a niche market and not something that uh, every retro gamer would want to play, but if you have a combination of the right stuff, you could actually get a pretty cool experience out of it for some games. Um, you know, Jaguar lo lovers will probably be mad at me that I said some games and everybody else will probably say, what do you mean some games? There are no good games. There are, and there are good experiences to have. And stuff like this uh, might even open up the homebrew on it even more. Just recently, people had hacked in better music into the Doom port of Jaguar, which uh, the Jaguar Doom port. So I'd really love to see this turn into something like that as well. It's something that homebrew developers and people that want to make new Jaguar games would be able to use this as an easier development tool than the Skunk board. Because, you know, just not everybody wants to have their Jaguar on and tethered to a computer while you pump command line prompts in to, to load up different ROMs and try different things. So while the skunk board served its purpose and it was excellent and I'm very happy that the developers made that available, that was more of a development tool, whereas this is really just everybody could use it as a both a development tool and a consumer device. So if you'd like yours, uh, check out the link below. The price is slightly different depending on shipping. Mine was a about 190 after shipping to the US. So I guess, you know, it'll probably be a little bit more or a little bit less than that for you. I just released a video titled Top 5 Tips for Buying an RGB Monitor Online. And it's the same style of content you could always expect from me with kind of a clickbaity title because I gotta be honest, I wanted this video to reach as many people as possible. So if I have to clickbait a title in order to do that, that's fine. You know, I'm sorry if that upsets you, but that's just the way it's gonna be. Um, I really think that this has the potential to help people avoid scammers and scalpers, uh, but it all depends on, I guess, how good a job I did presenting the info and how it's interpreted. And some of the interpretations already made me think uh, I, I should have spun it a little different. But one thing I will have to say, which is going to be a very negative opinion, is um, if you think that any of the examples that I used could possibly have been a, a misinterpretation or a mistake, that means that you'd have fallen for that scam. And I know people listening are probably going to get really pissed at that, especially the eBay one, though. And I chose those specific examples, both because I felt they illustrated the point well, but also because those were kind of the most amusing and things that had happened to me a lot in life. You know, I've been buying and selling stuff ever since the days of the bargain news back in the day. And every one of the things I mentioned are scams that have been going on since the freaking dawn of time. So... When I saw that unfold on eBay, as soon as the person said they wanted to do the transaction off eBay and then wanted me to drive, that's it. It's a scam. It definitely, without a doubt, a, a buyer with six feedback, all for cheap stuff. And if you don't realize that, that means you would have fallen for the scam. And I don't say that to make fun of you. I don't say that to tease you. And I certainly don't say that because I'm acting like I'm better than you. I'm just saying... That's the point of this video. I want to warn people of the stuff that could happen because it's very easy to get comfortable in the retro gaming scene because most of us are really nice people. And I'm not saying that to kiss ass to the people who might be listening to this. I very genuinely mean that. It's very easy to get used to talking to really cool people and to, to do some deals. And then next thing you know, you get sucked into one bad deal. And it, uh, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Even if you end up only losing a couple hundred bucks, that's a couple hundred bucks. Uh, so I, it's certainly something I would like to avoid and like I'd like to help everybody else avoid. So hopefully, uh, hopefully the video would be interpreted properly. Hopefully I did a good enough job on it. But honestly, I mean this as politely and genuinely as possible. If you watch that and you really think any of those scenarios weren't scams, then you're definitely at risk of being scammed yourself. Please be careful. Uh, and, you know, also on the bright side of things, 
most of the things I talk about in this video, most of the things to watch out for and the tips, most people don't have to deal with that. It's just highlighting what could go wrong and kind of also highlighting a little bit about what could go right. And speaking of buying and selling monitors online, I recently posted an interview with Blake, aka Spider Waffle. Um, the top five video had been done before this, but I just wanted to make sure that I put this out at about the same time, because I did want to show people the other side of things. Um, I wanted to show what it's like to be an honest reseller and somebody who really goes through and checks all the monitors. And, you know, I'm certainly, you know, no disrespect, of course, I'm certainly not trying to say this is the best monitor seller on the planet. I'm not trying to say that people haven't made mistakes or might continue to make mistakes. I just think Blake is a good example of somebody who, at least today, is making efforts to make sure that people get exactly what they pay for and what they're expecting. And at the end of the day, that's all you could really ask from somebody selling used vintage equipment. There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be everything. But, you know, if you buy a monitor for $600 and what you get you feel is worth that money or 1200 or whatever, that's fine. That's great. And uh, it's just, I thought it was a good way of showing that side of things. And there's a bunch of good monitor resellers out there and a bunch of good restore technicians. And hopefully I'd like to interview all of them. Um, I just, uh, I just happened to uh, talk to Blake first. So uh, that's what you get, uh, you know, that's what you get this week. And hopefully it's a good contrast to the other video. And ho hopefully the combination of both will give people a good idea of what to expect. And uh, like I said before, I mean, most of these transactions will go very, very smoothly. It's just the ones that don't could really uh, could really kill the mood for somebody. So hopefully you get both sides with between both the interview and the video. You know, you get what to look out for uh, and then what to what to expect on a positive way as well. Someone on the Arcade Projects forums has just put up for sale some JAMA extension cables. These are the same ones that Frank FJS, the same creator of the Sentinel Supergun, had designed and released open source. Um, and these seem to be very high quality extensions. Uh, and it uses an IDE cable for things like the uh, controller pinouts and a, a power connector, an ATX power connector with thick cables for power and video. And you know, it's, it's kind of funny because one of the reasons I loved the Hass and the Sentinel is it plugs directly on the board um, and you really have the shortest distance between the JAMA connector and the Supergun that configures everything for its outputs. Um, and, you know, on the opposite side of things, there are many situations in which I could understand the need for an extension cable be it test setups or how your setup is physically oriented or just for some PCBs that are a pain to have something connected directly to it. So I'm really glad people are making these things available. Um, I bought one. I'll check it out when, uh, as soon as it comes in. And uh, just, you know, thanks to everybody who makes these things and then open sources them. There's so many different things that could stem from stuff like this. And uh, it's just really cool to see. It's really cool to see the lengths that people go to keep arcade boards and arcade gaming alive. So thanks to Frank. Um, thanks to Benemy. Uh, I know I'm saying that wrong. I'm sorry. And of course, thanks to Ronnie for doing the post. Someone recently just picked up a bundle of arcade boards, and as they were going through and testing, found that one was an unreleased arcade game from Sega called Wanted. Um, it's based on a Vic Duel board, and it has soundboards from Head On and Space Attack, so it looks like an early 80s vertical style game. Um, and, you know, I, I saw the pictures of it. It looks okay, but uh, I really love the preservation factor in this stuff. You know, it doesn't have to be a good game for it to deserve to be preserved. And the fact that it was found and now they're going through the, um, the process of dumping the ROMs to get this working on MAME, I just think it's really cool that yet another thing is added to the list of uh, archives that we can now use. So very awesome that, uh, that the people who found that, the guy James and the people that are helping him, took the time to get this working, dump the ROMs and make this available. So very cool little find. Here's a pretty neat find. Um, Tian Fang had been testing some Turbo Graphics and PC Engine games and getting ready to start testing Artemio's upcoming version of the MD Fourier software, the audio testing software. And he had found that certain games were really loud and noisy on parts of the game that were silent. Um, and in checking them out, he then discovered that some versions of the game or even some time or some ways of playing them didn't have that issue. So they dug into it and Artemio found that the registers that the developers had put in the software code um, were doing things like panning stereo instead of lowering the volume. So 
after some research, Artemio figured out a way to change those registers and remove the noise in those games. So I just think that's such an awesome and weird and, and just a cool thing to have discovered all of these years later. So now if, uh, you know, if you have one of the games that has a bunch of noise in it, you could try changing some of these values and seeing if it goes away. Um, now, this is kind of like if anybody's ever heard uh, or had your sound up when the white Konami screen pops up on some of those games, the SNES and Genesis games, and you hear that loud buzz, that's kind of the same interference noise that it's going on here. It's actually a little bit more annoying than that, and it is only during silent parts of the games, but still, if you're playing your consoles through any kind of decent stereo and not just, you know, the speaker that's included in your PVM or something like that, it is a noticeable difference. So it's just so cool that we were able to stumble across this and archive it all of these years later. So huge thanks to Tian Fang and Artemio and anybody that's interested in checking this stuff out, please take a look at Artemio's page that uh, has everything that you could, uh, you would need to know about what to look for and what to change if you find the game with this noise in it. And just a quick update to something I talked about last month. Um, it looks like Video Game Perfection also is now stocking colored versions of the OSSC case. Their colors are translucent, not transparent. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it just means you have more choices if you would like to uh, add colors to your OSSC and make it pop. So um, now you could get them both from Classic Game Store as well as Video Game Perfection and a long list of colors that you could choose from. So as always, choices are fun, and uh, I like to make things colorful too. So very cool that uh, there's more people stocking this. Well, that's it for this week. As always, thank you so much to everybody who listens or watches. However you, uh, however you prefer the content is cool with me. And of course, thank you to everybody who signs up for any of the support platforms because that always makes such a difference. And, uh, you know, I'm really trying to keep this going as long as possible and I can't do it without your support. So thank you so much. Um, it's a million degrees in here and like 100% humidity. So I'm going to go drink a beer and try to cool off. <laughs> I'll see you all next week.